Hi, this is Dr. Kingston, and in this video I'll be discussing the pharyngeal lymphatic or tonsillar ring and going into a little bit more detail on the palatine tonsil. I'm actually going to be working through two of the learning objectives in this video. So we'll discuss both the makeup and drainage of the pharyngeal tonsil ring, and then we'll take a few minutes to talk specifically about the palatine tonsil, which are the big ones you can see in the back of your throat, in just a little bit more detail. The pharyngeal lymphatic ring, which is also called the pharyngeal tonsillar ring, or Waldeyer's ring if you're into eponyms, which we try to stay away from, um, is an arrangement of lymphoid tissue that's associated with the mucosa of the pharynx. These tissues are going to cluster into discrete patches or tonsils that form an incomplete ring around the entrance of the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. In the nasopharynx, a single pharyngeal tonsil, or an adenoid, sits at the superior edge of the ring, and two tubal tonsils are associated with the pharyngotympanic tubes on either side of that. In the oropharynx, the palatine tonsils sit inferior to the palate, uh, between the palatoglossal or pa and palatopharyngeal folds, and then the lingual tonsil covers the posterior third of the tongue. Now remember, lymphoid tissue is where immune cells are born and housed, so having a ring of this around the entrance of the airway in the digestive system is a great idea. It means that you can catch microbes and pathogens right as they come in. So the bad news, though, is that all of these tonsils shrink with age, and they're really most effective when you're pretty small. So as you age, they become less and less important, which is why surgical interventions to remove some of them are so common. Because they are uh, lymphatic structures, they're connected to the lymphatic drainage system of nodes and ducts. So immune cells um, in the tonsils will travel to other nodes to alert them to infections and to amp up the production of antibodies. The tonsillar ring structures will specifically drain into the jugulodigastric node, which is down here right around the angle of the mandible. Um, this is actually one of the first nodes a physician will palpate in your neck to determine if you have an infection in your pharynx. The pharyngeal tonsil, or the adenoid, sits at the superior border of the nasopharynx, so kind of right up here. Um, in the individual that's pictured here, the adenoid looks very small, but like I mentioned earlier, these tend to shrink with age, and most of our donors are pretty advanced in age by the time we have them in the lab here. So in children especially, the adenoids are much larger. And if you look down here in this picture, you'll notice that in small children, that nasopharynx is also relatively longer and narrower. And the combination of these two things, the large adenoids and the long, narrow nasopharynx, um, unfortunately means that the adenoids can impinge on the upper airway and restrict airflow coming in through the nasopharynx. So because of that, they are often surgically removed in a procedure called an adenoidectomy, which is pretty commonly done along with a tonsillectomy or removal of the palatine tonsils. Speaking of the palatine tonsils, we can find them pretty easily here in the oropharynx uh, by looking between the palatoglossal arch and the palatal pharyngeal arch. So here's our palatine tonsil right in there. These are going to get their primary blood supply from the tonsillar artery, which is a branch of the facial artery, but they're also going to receive some supply from the dorsal lingual branch of the lingual artery and the ascending pharyngeal artery. The palatine tonsils have a very characteristic cryptic appearance, so they have lots and lots of holes and gaps kind of interspersed between columns of tissue. Because of this, they're prone to infection and to things like tonsil stones forming from little bits of detritus that get stuck in there. Um, you've probably experienced an infection in these tonsils at some point, unless you're very lucky. The tonsil will then swell up, like we see down here in this picture, and very often we'll see little white spots forming here over those crypts where little patches of infection fill them up. The palatine tonsil's propensity for infection um, and their position near the top of the airway here make them really common candidates for surgical removal or tonsillectomy. It's an especially common procedure in children because their relative size in kids is so much greater. So it's not uncommon that they are so large that they block the airway to some extent, which can cause sleep apnea. In a tonsillac 
tonsillectomy, excuse me. The palatine tonsils are excised or cut away from the tonsillar fossa in between the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal folds. The floor of this fossa is made up of the pharyngobasilar fascia, and the superior pharyngeal constrictor is sitting just deep to that. Additionally, there are a couple of different neurovascular structures traveling nearby that surgeons have to be mindful of. The tonsillar artery, which is a very small branch of the facial artery, has to be ligated or closed off during the procedure. And as you can see here, this has a very close relationship uh, with the palatoglossal fold. The external palatine vein has to be similarly closed off. And this can be found in the superior tonsillar fossa. So that would be somewhere up here. Laterally in the fossa, deep to the tonsil itself, a surgeon has to pay mind to the glossopharyngeal nerve, which supplies the oropharynx mucosa and that posterior third of the tongue. Even farther laterally then, it's important to remember that you've got that internal carotid artery that's traveling superiorly on its way to the brain. The last tonsil that we'll look at here is the lingual tonsil, um, as the tubal tonsils kind of require some histology work to differentiate from the surrounding tissues. The lingual tonsil is what makes up the rugose patch on the posterior third of the tongue. So that is this rough patch right here that we're looking at. Here's the epiglottis coming down into the larynx and pharynx. Um, you can see it here in this posterior view covering pretty much the entire surface of the root of the tongue. It's made up of multiple little nodules that produce that bumpy appearance. It's going to receive its blood supply from the tonsillar artery and the dorsal lingual branch of the lingual artery. So pretty similar to what we see for the palatine tonsils. And that is going to bring us to our practice question. The correct answer here is A, the glossopharyngeal nerve. So remember that glossopharyngeal nerve is going to be providing somatic sensory innervation to the entire oro and laryngopharynces. So numbness in the oropharynx would imply that the glossopharyngeal nerve was damaged. That is going to bring us to the end. Thank you for watching.